tales for dark nights. Knuckle Supper Written by Drew Stepik Performed here by Jason Hill Chapter 21 Wizards Real Tim, not Tim, and new Tim parked in front of my cell. White guy, wake up! I'm up! <coughs> I responded. Get out of bed and turn towards the back wall, new Tim commanded. Playing dumb, I pointed at them. What's all that for? Despite my confused behavior, I knew that the shackles, cattle prods, and shotguns were to remove me from my dungeon. I got no answer and groggily did as they instructed. The car alarm sounded. My cell door unlocked and then opened behind me. Almost as instantly as the wheels that controlled the doors began to click, I felt the barrels of both shotguns shoved into the back of my head. Don't move. Not Tim barked. Sparks and the prods tingled up and down my spine. The new Tim crouched to my feet and swatted at my boots. Open your legs, he said. Do you want me to not move or open my legs? Real Tim and not Tim moaned. One of them eased a prod closer to my skin. Open your legs, idiot. As I separated my feet, new Tim clamped the shackles around my ankles and handed me the other end of the chain through the center of my legs. Put these on. I reached between my legs and dragged the connection upward as I clamped the metal cuffs around each wrist. You know, these can't hold me, don't you? I said. One of the barrels knocked at the back of my head. We know. The chains are just another deterrent. I picked a dry booger off the inside corner of my nose and flung it over my head. Who's to say that I won't turn around, break the chains, disarm you, and then rip the three of you to pieces? The prod zipped and zapped and I felt their heat at my kidneys. The shotgun tapped at the steel collar around my neck. This does, real Tim answered. I elongated my neck and swallowed as if I was loosening a tie. Yeah, I was wondering about that. No respect. Turn around slowly. Not Tim ordered. I did. The three Tims stood like a defensive line. Two arm lengths in front of me. Each of them had a shotgun pointed at the center of my face. I tried to adjust the collar with both my hands. What is this thing anyway? Insurance. The always witty not Tim said. Okay. I got that. What does it do? Does it shock me or something? The three Tims looked at each other and chuckled. Hardly. Not Tim returned, tugging on my shackles to make sure they were secured. He stepped backward, refocusing his gun on my face. If you do anything, and I mean anything that we're not sure about, we just say something to this. He rubbed the lapel in his priest uniform, and it takes your head clean off. Lights on, he spoke into the mic. Medium frequency. The beams on my side of the cells flicked on. Entire hallway. The lamps down the hall turned on as well. Almost immediately, I felt the drain. Since Herman and I had been spared the light torture for a few days, the bite felt stronger than I remembered. Even if I didn't have the collar on, my sudden lack of energy prevented me from doing any damage to the three Tims before I ended up headless or with a cattle prod jammed up my cornhole. Where are we going? Father McAteer wants to speak with you, New Tim said. Oh, are you taking me to confession or something? I hope so. I have a shitload of sins, you know, being a demon and all. Not Tim smacked me on the forehead with his gun. Pipe down, smart guy. It's not a confession, I assure you. Dismissive, I replied. Yeah, I assure you. We exited my cell. Real Tim and not Tim on my sides with their guns still fixed on my skull and their prods grazing my ribcage. New Tim walked behind us, targeting the base of my neck and my lower back. The walk was painful, but I sluggishly trekked onward to the door. Not Tim spoke into his microphone again as security cams above us feverishly scanned the scene for any funny business. Door, he said clearly. The industrial freezer-sized door disengaged and opened to a small caged-in clearance room. 
There was another guard sipping coffee as he watched the monitors. And, believe it or not, a rerun of Dagnabbit. Real Tim patted the top of the television. You know that little girl is the junky bitch who you've seen around here? No shit, the vigilant guard said, looking more closely at the set. I kid you not, Real Tim said. Deciding that cute little Dag Nabbit was indeed the habit, the guard bit into a piece of toast. Well, I was thinking about getting me some of that. I moved my bloated and dried out tongue to the side of my mouth. No, you weren't, loser. Even that bitch would kick your shiftless ass. What kind of priest talk is that, anyway? Not Tim tugged at my shackles. Keep moving. Next to the security monitors, there were several other colored screens that appeared to be tracking heart rates and body heat and the like. To the right of the main observation area, there were around 20 blue lockers. Every locker that I could see had an Irish or Scottish surname taped across the front. Pretty diverse bunch, the cloth, I thought to myself. Not Tim took the lead after tapping the fat-ass guard on the shoulder. He swiped a keycard across a black security panel that opened the cage. The card reader flipped from a red light to green. I looked over to the less talkative real Tim and said, What is this, a Radisson? Are you kidding me? Don't you guys have, like, retinal or fingerprint scanners? How do you expect to keep us in here with this nickel and dime shit? He blew a strand of sandy blonde hair out of his eyes. It's managed to keep you locked in here for weeks, smart guy. We proceeded into another hall. As we made our way across the gate's threshold, UV lamps hummed on before we reached them. It was a nice touch, and pretty high tech, even though I knew Fat Boy at the TV was timing our steps, but it still didn't make up for the archaic keycard technology. I mean, seriously, was there an advertisement for a pizza hut on the back of that thing? With my mind drifting away from reality, my walking became more and more lumpish as we neared the end of the second hall. Door 2. New Tim said into his microphone. I guessed it had to be a tag team effort to open the labyrinth from the inside out. Just like the first major obstacle, the door released and coasted open using hydraulics. I stared at real Tim's microphone. Did these mics at least have vocal recognition? I blew toward the rough mesh ball. He tapped my collar with his finger. Don't get any ideas. We are always in control. There is a microphone on the front of this. We turn them on and off depending on what Fat Mac wants us to do. Is it on right now? To this, not Tim clubbed me with his cattle prod across my thighs. I fell to my knees. Fuck, dude! Why? They dragged me back to my feet and we entered a large gymnasium with basketball hoops at either end. It looked more like a homeless shelter than a recreation center. On one side of the court were ten more cots like the dream bed I had been sleeping on every night. On the other side, there were approximately five rusted incubators. They were older and looked as if they hadn't been turned on in over ten years. Past the incubators was a secured and barricaded set of double doors that had a large Do Not Enter sign. Yellow caution tape zigzagged everywhere. It didn't take Matlock to deduce that it was a makeshift hospital where I was born. Short on breath from the UV lighting dangling from fixtures above us, I kept my cynical observations and conclusions to myself. We passed through one more secured steel door that led to a staircase going up. As real Tim and not Tim shoved me up the stairs with their shotguns in my armpits, new Tim supported my back with his hands. Ah! Oh God, it's like his skin is on fire! He said, pulling his sweaty hands away. After venturing through the central warship area of the Catholic Church that resided atop the stairs, we arrived at a series of unsecured doors. Each of the doors was plated with the name of the corresponding Irish Catholic priest who worked inside, at the end of a long line of O'Malley's and Sullivan's. We reached the doorway to Father McAteer's office. Exhausted from supporting me as we walked up the stairs, new Tim rounded me from the side and pressed a button on the intercom. Father McAteer, he said. Yes? Fat Mac's voice came from the intercom. We have the white one. We were buzzed into the office. New Tim looked at not Tim and real Tim and said, I'll catch up with you later. I have to work my security job tonight. 
Not Tim and real Tim made the sign of the cross, clutched the beads around their necks and said, We'll contact you when we need you again. And get some rest. Then they led me into the office. Now, not to criticize the allocation process of the church donations, but to say Fat Mac's office was palatial was an understatement. Vintage Bibles, books, and scrolls lined the walls corner to corner, only ending every so often to expose gleaming mahogany bookcases that gave off an unmistakable blossomy scent that filled the room. When I say that Fat Mac had walls of Bibles, I mean just that. Like an old-fashioned library, he had a ladder to get to those sometimes forgotten top-shelf books. Several museum-quality chairs surrounded a similarly chiseled, glossy desk. The sky opened to a stained glass ceiling that looked traced and blown from the prototype at the Sistine Chapel. The two remaining Tims stood at the door as I continued into the literary promised land. Please, Mr. Reynolds, Fat Mac said, inviting me to sit down. He looked across the room to the guards. You can go, my sons. The Tims did the cross thing again and left the room. I studied the microphone on Mac's priest garb. Lights. Low, he said. My throat gulped inside the metal collar as three production lights on boom stands triggered. Sorry about the lights. I can never be too cautious. Well, that's fine. I'm working on my tan. As I lethargically clumped my way to the desk, I noticed that Fat Mac was setting up dominoes. Please, give me a minute and enjoy the seat. I'm sure it'll be much more comfortable than the accommodations downstairs. I lumped into one of the chairs. Even though I shouldn't have cared, I actually was worried I was going to soil or break the chair. It was that nice. He looked over his reading glasses that rested on his globular nose. You do know why you're here, correct? Not really. Please don't keep me in suspense. You've already beaten the life out of me and dumped acid all over my chest. On top of all that, methadone isn't really a replacement for heroin and... Tastes like soy milk by comparison to the real shit. Well, fair enough. Some precautions are unavoidable. I'm sure you can understand. Refusing to make eye contact with my captor, I surveyed the room. Whatever, I said. He continued to set up his dominoes, seemingly as unfazed by me as I was by him. You understand the Catholic Church's stance on abortion, do you not? Yeah, I get it. Is, um, that what the cots and incubators in the gym were for? That is what they were for, Mr. Reynolds. Were. Fat Mac moved down the line, making sure that all his dominoes were aligned correctly. He then reversed to the end to begin placing more bones. You see, a long time ago, this parish became a safe house for drug-addicted prostitutes and battered homeless women. You know. Women in abusive relationships. You, your friends, and your enemies are a byproduct of our somewhat well meaning yet misguided efforts. I turned away from the bookshelves. Misguided. I don't follow. He stopped with a domino pinched between his thumb and index finger. The former cardinal of this church, God rest his soul, decided to take the word of our Lord a step farther than most. He returned to his construction. Father Herlihy was a great man. But, like all of us, he misinterpreted the good word. He gave life to those who did not have life. I looked up at the stained glass. It barely shaded me from the approaching noon sun, almost booming through. I pushed my seat back a little, as if the stage lights weren't tormenting enough. Fat Mac pointed to the ceiling. Precautions... He paused, assessed the domino set up again, and continued. You see, Mr. Reynolds, you're alive because we gave you a gift that we now know should never have been given. Filthy sweat dripped from the ends of my hair. Doesn't feel like a gift. You have my friend, or, um, me and Cobra, chained up in your torture chamber downstairs. What are you going to give me for Christmas? A crucifixion? Yes, yes, we have been a tad malicious toward you. Cut to the chase. You delivered us from evil by bringing us into this world. 
close, he said, paying more attention to his stacking game. You are, or were, a stillborn child. You, like many of the others, were born addicted to heroin. Your mother came to the church as many other hopeless teenagers before her. She searched for guidance from God because she wanted to terminate the pregnancy. She also wanted somewhere to sleep. We took in as many as we could and gave them shelter. We gave you life as a result. Many romanticized theories I had about my existence, whether it was being bitten by a baron from Transylvania or being the spawn of Lucifer, were quickly swept behind the bookcases that surrounded me. I damped the back of my hand on my blistering forehead. How is that possible? Not all of you are stillborn. Some of you were premature, while others were just born addicted. That's why you need the narcotics, Mr. Reynolds. Quite simply, your hunger for heroin is why you live. I scooted further back, away from the glaring rays slam dancing from above. That's still impossible. It doesn't explain why I'm a living, breathing, thinking being. If I was stillborn, how am I alive? On top of that, why am I so strong? Why am I so sensitive to light? Why can I hear shit that regular people can't? I am a vampire. If I wasn't alive when I was born, then how are we talking right now? Be careful what you say, Mac. The will and love of God isn't the correct answer. He rubbed his nose a little, causing his glasses to slip down. He pushed them back to an approved domino setting level. I assure you that it is nothing that spiritual. After we delivered you, we incubated you and gave you strength by feeding your addiction. At the same time, we gave you constant blood transfusions from clean members of our congregation. What about the fucking strength, asshole? Your strength is a side effect. To counter your inability to grow normally, we gave you growth hormones and steroids. The stimulants caused an overreactive blood system and heart rate that constantly, but slowly, drained your life cycle. He fumbled and dropped a domino on the floor. Let me ask you a question. I crossed my legs, uncrossed them, and put my elbows on my knees. Shoot. Can you use without the help of warm blood? He carelessly set up the domino he dropped on the floor. It almost tumbled backward. Using his pinky, he narrowly avoided complete destruction. Smoke started to ignite from my pores. I can. It depends on how much blood I have in my body, I guess. Is that the answer you're looking for? It is the exact answer. Your body does not produce hemoglobin on its own. It only eats it because of the enhancing drugs. The drugs have since become unavailable, thankfully. They were a test drug to control the effects of progeria on children, the disease that causes them to age too fast. They failed to counter the aging process, however. They sped up the circulatory system. Anyway, they spun your bodies into an uncontrollable spiral that it cannot break out of. As you have seen over the past few weeks, we can cure you from the heroin addiction. However, we can't cure you from your bodily disease. The need for your body to be constantly replenished with fresh blood is irreversible. I am sorry. As the sun reached noon, I tried to poke holes in this story, wishing it weren't the truth. So, what about the battle snakes? They can't be addicted to marijuana. Ignoring my pain, Fat Mac continued wrapping another outer wall to his now circular structure. As far as I know, you cannot become addicted to cannabis. We didn't give them marijuana while nurturing them, though. We gave them whatever drug their birth mothers were addicted to. Like most things in our modern society, smoking marijuana was a learned behavior that suited them and their lifestyle. It was also tidy, so not paranormal or alien or supernatural. I was correct when I told Herman that I was the product of the streets. Jesus, is this the only church that did this? No. Other churches in North America participated. My skin tightened to my insides as a dark cloud rolled over the sun. I exhaled, relieved, and let out a huge puff of smoke. 
Are you telling me that the Vatican is involved with this? Are you kidding me? Oh, I'm afraid not, Mr. Reynolds. We acted as the Order of the Cloth. We would have told the Vatican if our pro-life crusade hadn't gone so terribly awry. Overwhelmed by the bombardment of information, I continued to throw low-numbered cards at him, bluffing and hoping to maybe win a hand. So, why can't any of us remember anything before we were teens? He flipped a block in line on his desk and then took off his reading glasses. We kept you here on life support in several closely guarded locations around Los Angeles until I felt you were at the age to survive on your own. So... You dumped us on the streets without a user's manual. What kind of shit is that, you fucking hypocrite? As I looked up to see my savior cloud rolling away, I put my arms over my face for protection. Mac paced around his structure, checking to see if any pieces were out of line. Be thankful, my son. Thankful? Be thankful for what? For being a living dumpster abortion? Life is a gift from God. Accept it in your heart while you can. I stood and kicked the chair back behind me. It smashed into wood chips as I blasted it against the wall. Unfazed, Mac cleared his throat and yelled, At Stringle Guter! The microphone in the necktie was on. The collar turned like a screw and constricted around my neck. My body broke down into spasms as I flipped onto my back. I gasped for air and tried in vain to loosen the steel device. Please! I begged. La befactum guter. Instantly, the collar choker reversed. I remained on the floor, sucking in huge lungfuls of oxygen. Defeated. Broken. And clearly not of uncanny origin. I asked. What do you want? I should be clear, Mr. Reynolds. We need you to right the church's mistakes. As somewhat predicted, he recited the narrative from his ridiculous demonstration. The Lord giveth. He then flicked at the first domino in line. His dramatic climax to the dreadful explanation of my life was short-lived as the toppling effect only lasted under a quarter of the way through the progression. He rushed to the roadblock that was delaying the fully realized potential of easily the lamest denouement in history. He swatted the disobedient block over. The Lord taketh away, he concluded. As the last brick toppled in the center, he made the sign of the cross. Even though I felt my gland swell into the neckband, I had to say something. Do you think I'm fucking retarded? What was all that? Unsure if I was questioning the context of his stupid performance, or if I just didn't understand it at all, he answered... A demonstration? I rolled under one of the chair backs to shield my body from the light. Why? Embarrassed at himself, he opened a drawer on his desk and began sashaying the dominoes inside. I don't know. You're the first one of your kind that I have ever spoken to beyond phone calls. I mean, tried to convey this delicate situation to. Disgusted, I asked. By using toys and games? They tried to plead innocent. It... It... It was just... He stuttered. I get it, asshole. Please take me back to my cell. Good evening. This is Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast. You've been listening to a chapter from the award-winning novel Knuckle Supper by best-selling author Drew Stebeck. Knuckle Supper, Ultimate Gutter Fix Edition, and its critically acclaimed sequel, Knuckle Bald, are available now from Bloodbound Books. Check out the links in the video description and sticky comments below to pick up a copy today and show your support for indie horror. Also, please consider making a donation to Children of the Night today and help end teen prostitution and human trafficking. Children of the Night is a privately funded nonprofit organization established in 1979 with the specific purpose of providing intervention in the lives of children who are sexually exploited and vulnerable to, or involved in, prostitution and pornography. 
Visit childrenofthenight.org for more information today. From author Drew Stepik and all of us here at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, thanks for listening and for your support. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 